we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Today, we are going to be talking about creating effective home and school environments for individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or FASD. We are the Human Development Center, and we've officially rebranded. This is our new logo, and we're going to talk about what the Human Development Center is briefly before Chris and I jump in. So the Human Development Center is Louisiana's Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, or USED. USEDs are a part of the AUCD network, or the Association of U University Centers on Disabilities, which include institutions across the U.S., such as Vanderbilt Kennedy Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities and the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, the Mailman Center in Miami, among others. This provides us with a network of experts in the field of developmental disabilities to collaborate with and learn from. HTC serves as a resource to people with disabilities, their families, service providers, educators, and policymakers. From individuals to systems, HTC builds capacity and inspires change throughout the life cycle to ensure that people with disabilities are able to participate fully in all aspects of community life. Um, and HTC has initiatives from birth to adulthood. Both Krista and I are facilitators at the Lassard Project, which is within the Human Development Center at the LSU Health Science Center in New Orleans. I'm Allie and I have a background in special education. I was a classroom teacher and special education consultant before joining the Human Development Center. I love talking about executive functioning and working with school teams on their inclusive programs. I am also the mom of two children with disabilities. And I'll throw it to Krista and she can introduce herself. Hi, I'm Krista James and I am um, a facilitator for um, for LSU for the Human Development Center. Um, and uh, I am uh, transitioning into a new position where um, we are going to be starting some uh, FASD initiatives for the state of Louisiana. And I'm gonna be helping to um, start those initiatives. I am the mom of three daughters uh, with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, I previously was a special education teacher, an administrator and a professor um, in special education. And uh, um, I really love working with our teams on um, bridging that gap between home and school and working with families. Um, so uh, I'm really excited about this presentation that we're doing today. Thanks, Krista. So um, for this presentation today, you can take a moment to pause the video to scan the QR code. This will give you access to a Google Drive that has note pages that follow along with this, along with various resources that you can use and share. Our objectives today is that you'll understand the brain differences with FASD and the impacts to learning. Um, you'll implement these strategies to set up successful family school partnerships, and you'll be able to apply best practices and supports to the home and or school environment. And just one more thing before we get started, this is a graphic that we got from the Center on Secondary Education for Students with Autism, but it does help us ground our work. Um, it's such a perfect way to capture what we believe and why we do what we do, and we like to include it in all of our presentations. They say that a person needs just three things to be truly happy in the world, someone to love, somewhere to go, and something to do. And this core value and guiding principle is at the heart of the work that we do with people with disabilities and those who support their learning. In order for this quality of life to happen, it's essential that we teach the skills that they need to lead a successful life. Where are they going after high school? What are they going to do? Do they have the skills necessary to find and hold a job, to make and keep friends and have access to everything available to them in their communities for recreation and leisure? So in short, if we want the individuals we work with to have a pretty good life, we need to make sure that they have the skills that make that happen. And today we're going to talk about some of those skills and how we can support learners um, who have FASD. So uh, before we get into supports for people with FASD, we just wanna give you a little overview of what FASD is, um, how alcohol affects the brain so that we're all kind of have a same basic level of understanding going into this. 
Um, so FASD is the result of the effect of alcohol on the fetus. Uh, pregnancy lasts 40 weeks and the fetal brain is vulnerable during that entire pregnancy. Any of the common physical aspects associated with FASD occur during a six week window in early pregnancy when a woman may not even yet know that she's pregnant. Anytime a woman drinks, the alcohol can influence whatever is developing in the baby at the time. The part of the fetus that is affected depends on when during the pregnancy the alcohol was consumed and the amount of alcohol consumed. Alcohol can easily cross the placenta and go directly to the fetus and damage developing cells. When brain cells are damaged, the body tries to heal by sending cells to those damaged areas. The cells create a structural layer of support for the brain, but the layer is filled with non-thinking cells. Therefore, the brain does not grow as it should and the abnormal connections are formed between different parts of the brain. The process of forming connections between different parts of the brain is called lamination. And improper lamination directly influences the brain's capacity for abstract thought, linking, cause and effect, generalization, memory, attachment, and it also influences sexual behavior. So the changes in the brain development are permanent. Brain damage does not repair itself over time and it does not progress. And there is no cure for the damage that's sustained. Using alcohol while pregnant can have two kinds of impacts on the child. Um, the first are primary disabilities that are the direct result of the alcohol on the fetus. And the second are secondary disabilities that occur after birth as a result of the primary disabilities. So primary disabilities are divided into two categories, those that are result from the damage to the brain and those resulting from the damage to the other parts of the body, such as the bones or the organs. So for this presentation, we're going to focus on those that are affecting the brain. And uh, those are neurological impairment. So this shows itself in the small head and undeveloped brain. Uh, the information processing disorders, this results in gaps and inconsistencies in understanding sequencing and auditory processing of information. Memory and attention deficit, this results in spotty or faulty memory and limited attention span. Language delays, this may result in limited vocabulary and comprehension and problems with the clarity of the speech or having a speech impairment. And then developmental delays. So the results may be delayed walking, late talking, or problems with balance, coordination, and fine motor skills. Secondary disabilities occur after birth whenever there's a mismatch between the person and their environment. Early diagnosis and appropriate interventions can reduce these secondary disabilities. And these are some examples of secondary disabilities that can be lessened or eliminated through appropriate interventions. And those are mental health disorders, challenges in school, trouble with the law, unsafe sexual behavior, and drug and alcohol addiction. So we know that families are the experts when it comes to their own children. They live with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, families often complain that teachers don't quote unquote get it. When, um, and what they mean is that as a parent, they see different needs than those that are evident in the classroom. So educators and parents must learn from each other and work together to develop consistent and comprehensive support for people with FASD. And when we're supporting birth families, we have to remember that birth families are already dealing with an unbearable load um, uh, from the shame and the grief um, that is associated with their child's fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And uh, this can be um, even more so than, than with other disabilities, such as like autism, um, because they feel like they have caused um, this disability for their child. And uh, community attitudes also add to that load because um, the mothers of children with FASD, just like all other mothers, they really want to deliver happy, healthy babies. And the damage that their children uh, um, sustained before birth was not 
inflicted with malice, intent, or even in most cases, understanding. And it may well be a part of a larger tragedy that encompasses the child, the mother, and all of those that are surrounding them. So we want to consider uh, the following information about birth mothers of children with FASD. Um, some of them are social drinkers. Um, they may have um, drank whenever they didn't even know that they were pregnant yet. Um, some of them might be alcoholics and they might be um, um, trying to quit drinking for their baby, but um, are in the middle of a, a, a addiction process. And uh, um, many of them can have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder themselves. And then um, we know that most of them are the survivors of some form of abuse, and oftentimes it is sexual abuse. So we want to make sure that when we're remembering, um, when we're working with birth families, that there are many different factors that go into um, <clears throat> supporting them and also making sure that we are not, we are destigmatizing um, that diagnosis for those families. So we want to make sure that we're examining our own biases. Instead of adding to the guilt and the grief that parents already suffer, teachers really need to be conscious of their own attitudes and biases and resist judging um, the families. So we all have our own struggles and some of which may be related to alcohol. So here are a few questions you can ask um, of yourself so that you can kind of get this narrative started and start thinking about these things um, in your own life, in your own mind, um, and also start having this conversation with others. So what, what do I know about alcoholism? Um, and if you don't um, have a good understanding of alcoholism, it might be a good place to go and start some research. Uh, what do I think about a man who drinks while his partner is pregnant? Is that different than a woman um, who drinks when she's pregnant? Where can a woman who is drinking and pregnant get help? And the kicker is, where can she get help and also not risk losing her children? Um, because that oftentimes women are afraid to get help because they're afraid that their children will be taken away. What do I think about the impact of alcohol in my community? And what role does alcohol play in my own life? And then these are just some questions that you can kind of get your thinking started as you're, as you're um, examining uh, um, your thoughts and beliefs about alcohol. So family dynamics can uh, make creating connections with families challenging and teachers may feel um, they face an, a really huge task, but it's really crucial to invite the family to be involved with the school and accept that involvement in whatever form it comes. So family involvement in schools falls along a continuum from family-centered to professional-centered. And so this table shows um, these different approaches and what the interactions might look like for each type. So a family-centered approach is the most successful in creating positive relationships with families. And this is particularly true for families of children with disabilities and critical for families of students with FASD. A family-focused or a family-centered model for students with FASD assists the, um, educators in creating a connection with families. And successful partnerships are really based on four principles. The first is a no fault model. So in this model, no blame is placed on the family or the school. Um, this is a critical point when dealing with, stu with a student with FASD's birth parents and even adoptive and foster parents. Um, they may feel a tremendous shame and guilt because they have a child with FASD. And so there are many reasons why women turn to alcohol, but the birth mothers need support and compassion, not judgment and blame. Equally, it must be recognized that teaching a student with FASD has, FASD has many challenges and the teacher should not be blamed or feel guilty for not always getting it right. The second one is a strength-based approach which focuses on the child's strengths rather than their deficits. Um, consider the student's strengths in both school and home settings. And both families and teachers are often surprised at what a student can do in another setting. And the emphasis on a student's unique strengths allows for them to be seen in a positive light 
and provides a springboard to success. The third one, um, it's essential to consider the influence school and family contexts have on each other. If a child has a very bad day at school, um, the teacher should consider that something may have happened outside the school to influence um, performance. Or if a child comes home from school and behaves um, differently from earlier in the day, then parents should consider what happened at school. Homeschool communication on a regular basis is vital um, for successful collaborations. And the fourth one is family empowerment. And family empowerment through active decision-making must be um, a, an integral aspect of the partnership. The parents of a child with a disability face a lifelong job of advocating for their child. Uh, for the family that has the capacity to take on this job, the first years of school are an opportunity to learn advocacy skills. And advocacy skills can increase parent confidence and lead to positive outcomes for their child in school and then once they're out of the school system. So these four principles will help teachers create successful partnerships with families. And research even shows that some um, barriers to parent participation are within the control of schools and that schools have more influence on parent involvement um, than do the characteristics of the parent. So Christensen suggests that the most important influence on parent involvement comes from the teacher's worldviews and how um, these influence their work. So when teachers believe parents want to be involved, actively seek parent involvement and are comfortable as partners with parents, they succeed in increasing parent involvement in the child's education. So here are some strategies um, that can help school staff involve parents who might seem reluctant to participate. Uh, the first one is to maintain a positive, non-judgmental approach, even if the response seems negative. Uh, next, continue to invite parents to come to school, even if they refuse or they don't respond to invitations. Try a range of ways to contact them in addition to letters and phone calls. See if there's a school staff member, such as a social worker or a community liaison who could visit the home or arrange a get together with a teacher. Um, ask for the assistance of someone from an agency that might be involved with the family, such as a social worker, to see if they might accompany um, you on a home visit uh, with prior notice to the family. Offer to meet parents at a location of their choice, such as a community center, a library, or local park. Suggest parents invite someone to come to the meeting to support them, such as a family member or a family friend, um, a social worker or a counselor. Take advantage of the opportunity to meet parents in an informal setting where their child is not the topic of the conversation. For example, like a community pancake breakfast. Uh, it can be easier if you make the, con um, the connection in, a, in this setting um, to it eases you into connections later on. And then long-term members of the community who are employed or the, at the school, such as paraprofessionals or language teachers, might also be good links with the family. There must be a strong, be strong leadership from the school administration and support from peers if the teacher is to be effective in involving parents and provide a single contact person at the school for parents, even if there are siblings in other classes at the same school, so that they only have that one person who's reaching out and trying to make contact with them. Um, try to partner parents with other parents who may understand the school system and how it works, and they can be a source of information that may be less threatening than a direct contact with teachers and administrators. And consider the use of programs that provide wraparound services for the student and the family, such as community-based um, PBIS models and medical home models. Okay, so now we're going to get into um, homeschool supports. And so we're gonna give you lots of ideas for supports that we can use for um, students with FASD and for our children with FASD. 
and that can be used across settings. So they can be used within um, at school and then transition generalized over to using it in the home and the community. So today we're going to be using the term visual supports a lot. So what do we mean when we refer to visual supports? Um, visual supports are any materials that illustrate important information, facilitate transitions, convey expectations, and provide understanding and predictability. So these can be pictures or icons only. They can be pictures or icons with words or just words, but they're space-based, which means that they stay in place where the student can reference them as often as needed to successfully accomplish what the visual conveys. Words are time-based and they're transient, so as soon as you say them, then they're gone and there's no way for the student to go back and reference them. Uh, in cases where we find ourselves having to repeat something over and over, that's a situation where we would consider replacing our spoken instructions with a visual. All of us use visuals to provide information um, about our environment or to help us to stay organized with tasks that we have to do. And so think about all the visual supports that we encounter on a daily basis. Um, labels, signs, our calendar, lists, directions, maps. Um, there's probably some even in the room that you're sitting in right now. So you can look around and see uh, what visuals are standing out to you. And in, in each support area that we're gonna discuss today, we'll have various examples of visual supports that can be used at home and or school. So we're gonna start off with environmental structure and priming for change. Um, structure not only create, creates predictability and a sense of calm, um, but it also helps students to be able to predict and anticipate what's going to happen next. Structure can also be utilized to clarify physical boundaries and define space and to teach expected behaviors in different environments and locations. One of the first things we should do when setting up a supportive home or school environment is to develop clear and concrete rules and expectations. Routines should be sequenced so that each step is clearly outlined and easy to follow. Some home routines might include getting ready for school, um, homework time after school, and getting ready for bed. And school routines might include arrival, logging onto a computer, transitioning between activities or classes, or even how to walk in line. When we, do, when we strategically develop, teach, model and refer to our posted visuals, the student will learn to use the supports to navigate the environment and to predict and sequence the activities they're being requested to do throughout the school day. So what is the basic information that students need to know to independently meet expectations and minimize the need for you to provide verbal reminders? So these questions are, will serve as a guide as you begin to design visual supports for your environment. Where do I go? Where do I sit? What's off limits? What's available? And where and how can I get help? Environmental cues are visuals that help the students know what is expected of them in a specific place such as the classroom. These visuals promote independence for all students regardless of their age or their exceptionality. Labels can help individuals know where to find items in the classroom and where to put them when they're cleaning up. Think about a pre-K classroom. You'll want to label everything to promote independence for all students, designated seats, cubbies, centers, materials, toys, and other activities. Visual cues such as a stop sign could help the student understand the boundaries to keep them safe in the classroom. And visual boundaries make a specific area more obvious by showing the student an area to stay within or to stay away from. And a stop sign posted on the door can be used to teach the, teach the child to stop and not walk any further. Other visual cues could include um, a new, no student sign near the teacher's desk or a no climbing sign on furniture um, to prevent accidents. And just think about any visual reminder that your students or your child would need to know to be successful and independent, and then also the expectations that you're constantly having to remind them about. So teachers and parents can set visual boundaries that reinforce the expectations 
by using a visual support. Um, the, the, this visual support is simply tape that's put down to mark specific boundaries like work areas or where the chair should stay. Um, here's an example of an individual visual schedule. Uh, this one is uh, called a first then. And so first then, I, I always think of it like um, grandma's law. So first you eat your, eat your vegetables and then you get your ice cream. So that's what a first then is. First you do what I want you to do and then you get to do what you want to do. And it's a great way to start teaching students to use a visual schedule. So think about the children that um, may need more support to stay on task and transition seamlessly or who have difficulty with changes or who are constantly out of their desk or off task during an activity. And these kids may require schedules that are more individualized. So using schedules helps to promote structured environments and makes routines predictable. The kids know what to do, um, what's coming up and what's expected of them. And so here's two examples of, um, of an individual uh, daily schedule. And the first one example from Mike, it, we just um, wrote the words out because Mike's able to, to read those and he just checks them off whenever he's completed the task. Um, the next one, we have pictures. Um, if a student needs, if they're, um, they need the pictures to go with the words, then we can easily provide that on their schedule. And so that's a, um, another way to make it so that it's more meaningful to them and that they can use it more independently. Um, here are some more examples of visual schedules for you. The first one is a morning routine. And so um, it may be difficult for a child to have um, the whole uh, day laid out for them in one place. So we, we could break that into a morning routine and an after routine, afternoon routine. Um, the next one is um, just on the refrigerator for our home schedule. And the last one, um, which is actually a template on our website that um, if you would like to go to our Lassard website and download, you can. And it's a, a schedule where they just move the picture from to do to all done. <clears throat> and here's um, another example of a visual schedule. This one's actually a weekly schedule. So you can see that under each day of the week, um, for Madison, it's written out um, her schedule for Monday, her schedule for Tuesday, um, so that she can have access to that throughout the week. Priming is exposure to information or activities ahead of time. And this is especially important if, um, if it's something the individual is likely to have difficulty with. So priming ensures pre predictability and is possibly one of the easiest supports that you can provide. Uh, it takes little prep time and um, can be done anywhere. So whether you realize it or not, you're probably using priming all of the time. Um, for example, before I take my kids into a restaurant, I might tell them things like who's going to be joining us, um, what kind of food they have, what time we're going, and about how long we'll be sp staying, what the behavioral expectations are while we're there, so priming really helps to ease anxiety about unknown situations. So here's some other ways that priming can be incorporated into the school day. You can review a student's schedule at the beginning of the day and make note of any changes or anything that's going to be different. You can review the steps of an activity. You can review rules and expectations, review tools and strategies for self-management, Prepare students for upcoming events, such as a test or a field trip or an assembly, and prepare a student for potential questions and responses before class. So we're going to show you what some of these can look like um, um, in the classrooms. Uh, the next section that we're going to get into are sensory supports. And... Um, Students with FASD or children with FASD can have a lot of challenges with um, regulating their sensory systems. And so it's really important that um, we consult with an occupational therapist and uh, um, learn as much as we can about how to um, understand and provide supports uh, for, for the sensory system. So... <clears throat> 
when your to-do list for, looks like this, which is the first picture, so what do you need in your environment to be able to focus and accomplish the task? So think specifically around the areas listed. So if I have to get all of these things done, then what do I need it the, my environment to be like? What are the set, what the auditory, what what do I need it to sound like? Movement, what do I need um, as far as a, a movement for my body? Um, touch, visual, smells, taste. Um, so I have to think about in order for me to focus uh, and get all of this accomplished, what does all of this need to be like for me? So sensory processing is the ability to process information from all of these sensory systems, and it's vital for us to understand the world and how to respond to it. Sensory processing is the organization of sensory information from the body and the external world. It allows a person to interact effectively with their physical and social environments. And simply put, it's taking in information from all of your senses, processing them, and then turning them into appropriate behavioral responses. Most of us have brains that do this continuously without us even have to, having to think about it. Um, the brain decides what we're going to attend to and respond to and what we're not. And this varies a lot from person to person because everybody's brain is unique. It's why you can be in a room with others and one person is immediately bothered by the noise of someone's fingernails tapping on a keyboard. Another person hears it but tunes it out and another person doesn't even notice it. Sensory processing is a continual process, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. After our brains um, process the sensory information, uh, we have a response. So to function appropriately in the world, take in the information, process it, and have a behavioral response, our bodies have to regulate themselves based on our sensory information. Um, it can be conscious or subconscious. Bra the brain attempts to keep itself at an optimum level, and we sometimes do things without even being aware of it. Um, learning can't occur if our arousal level is too high or too low. Um, we need to be in an alert but calm state to be ready to engage in learning tasks. And the arousal levels fluctuate throughout the day. And those fluctuations are different for everyone. We all have sensory regulation difficulties at different times in our lives um, or within the day. So these strategies will help those students who typically regulate efficiently, um, but are having an off day. So example, when I'm stressed from work um, or it's hot or I get in the car, um, I it, it's hot outside, I get in the car, I put my AC on full blast, the radio on, um, the wind blowing, the noise, the um, all of that can help me to, to um, reduce that stress for the day. So sensory processing disorder is a complex disorder of the brain that affects um, developing children and adults. Um, it's not a standalone diagnosis, but it's associated with other diagnoses in the DSM. And um, there are there is one sensory integration um, component that is listed on um, our a list of evidence based practices. Um, so students with and without identified uh, disabilities may under or over register sensory input in any of these sensory areas, which can cause them to either seek out input or to be overly sensitive and to avoid it. Um, it's important that as teachers and school, um, that, that teachers and school supports and parents that we recognize that some of the signs and the symptoms, um, so we understand how sensory issues affect behavior. So this can allow you to make some very basic or general adjustments to the environment or the routine and guide you in determining when to make necessary um, referrals or to seek out outside supports. So sensory processing disorder can involve one sensory system or multiple systems at the same time. And you can have one system that can over-respond while another system under-responds. 
So it's, it's, um, it's always kind of like being the detective to try and figure out what we need to change in the environment in order to act, um, help regulate that sensory system. When we talk about regulation and sensory processing disorder, we wanna think of it as sensory buckets and then being filled to just the right amount to allow adequate attention to the right information so that we can respond appropriately. So if our bucket is too big or too small or fills or empties too slowly or too quickly, then we're gonna see those results in the form of behavior. It's important to remember that these levels can fluctuate for all of us, but we all know um, some, some kids that who stay at that high or low ends. And today we're gonna look at three different types of um, sensory processing disorder and some general strategies that you can use to address those. So the large sensory bucket it, um, that needs to be filled, it needs more sensory input than, um, than a typical bucket. So it has a high need for sensory input in order to respond. Sensory information comes in, but then it gets lost along the way. They may appear tired or disinterested, um, very likely because their sensory experiences are not intense enough for them to notice and respond. Typically, um, these aren't the kids that are, are causing problems uh, or having a behavioral outburst. And the low registration can often go undetected uh, until preschool or early elementary years, whenever they start to have difficulty learning or following directions. So example, while most of us can take a, a step, someone with low registration would need to jump in order to give their body the same amount of sensory information as that step. Um, increased amounts of sensory input are, are that are more intense are what they need they, in order to alert them. So these alerting type activities, um, it could be uh, things like chewy necklaces, strong flavors, bouncing, or hand or foot fidgets. Um, and those are some ideas for strategies for those for those kids. Then we have our sensory seeker. Sensory seekers have a high need for sensory input and typically make sure that their high threshold is met by actively seeking it out. It's like a large bucket with a hole that never fills up. So behaviors that are indicative of sensory seeking are being active, continuously engaging, fidgety, and very excitable, they may seem to lack consideration for safety when playing and may run into the street or parking lot without really having a second thought. They're the kids that you find on the refrigerator, the bookcases. Um, sensory seeking kids are often in constant motion and sometimes have a hard time playing with other kids because they're so rough or preoccupied with sensory, with seeking that sensory input. And they may also have a hard time sitting down to focus on activities. Those activities can be anything from homework to eating dinner. And then finally, our small sensory bucket. Our small sensory bucket, um, they don't need a lot of sensory input to react. And uh, um, often they manage the environment or the situation to avoid that sensory input. Um, so when the bucket overflows, you get a meltdown or that fight, flight, or freeze response. They have a really low threshold um, for sensory input. So these might be your picky eaters. Um, they might be um, covered the kids that cover their ears whenever they're around loud noises. They may avoid messy activities, um, but their bucket is very small and it doesn't take a lot to, for it to fill up and overflow. So what do we do? How do we get our under-registered sensory seekers and, and sensory sensitive students to the optimal level of sensory regulation so that they can learn? Utilizing sensory breaks and spaces as part of our routine can help a calm, alert, and organize uh, student sensory systems so that they can focus on schoolwork, their relationship, and their relationships with peers and adults. A sensory space creates a positive school culture because it supports a student's health and well-being and can benefit all students. We all have sensory needs, but especially those who have adverse childhood experiences 
or sensory processing disorders and need help with regulation at different times throughout the day or the week. So let's look at three sensory processing disorders we talked about earlier and what they need to regulate. So the poor sensory reg registration, they need alert. So they need more input. Um, they're a large bucket to be filled, things to alert their system. Um, the sensory seeker, they're more tricky. They need alerting type activities, but presented in a calm way so that the sensory system can organize. Remember, it's the large bucket with the hole. So a seeker will run and jump and play for an extended amount of time and doesn't tire, but seems more out of control the more they move. Their brain is not receiving the input, so they just keep going because it didn't get filled. So to address their sensory deficits, you would think they need to calm um, because their behavior is so active, but actually they need more input, but in a structured way with an emphasis on the vestibular and proprioception, which is the heavy work and the deep pressure to help them organize. And then sensory sensitive, that's our calm, small bucket. Um, they need sensory experiences uh, that are calming to reduce that stimulation um, on the sensory environment and on the sensory system. <clears throat> so we talked about the three SPDs and in general, what those students need to be regulated for learning. So what do these activities look like? Um, first, we're going to look at alerting and calming activities, and then we'll talk about organizing a little bit later. So um, alerting activities would be bright, uh, light, bold colors, um, clutter, uh, light touch or tickles, um, loud, quick, uh, so loud sounds, quick beats on music. Calming would be soft, neutral colors, um, soft or dim lighting, uncluttered spaces, uh, deep pressure, firm touch, uh, white noise, soft or gentle sounds, and slow beats to music. Alerting would be um, minty or citrus smells, and our spicy, crunchy, sour, or cold tastes. And then calming um, smells would be lavender or chamomile, and calming tastes would be uh, uh, um, things that we have to chew or suck on, things that are sweet, bland, or warm. And then alerting um, in the vestibular would be fast movement or rotation. Um, in proprioceptive, it would be heavy resistance activities. And in um, interoception, it would be skipping, jumping, or running. And calming, it would be that slow back and forth movement of swinging or rocking, um, heavy weights, pulling or pushing, and soft music, uh, rocking, yoga, breathing, and mindfulness exercises. So how do we do it? How do we create sensory breaks and sensory um, spaces to meet the needs of our kiddos? So our goal is to get it, get the student to the just right or the Goldilocks level of regulation um, to calm, alert, and organize. So you can implement a whole class level of alertness scale and use gestures or hand signals for students to check in on where they are. Um, be creative for those times when you have a mix of high and low. Um, create a movement circuit um, with alerting stations followed by um, calming as students return to their desks. Um, you can have it, um, place students, sorry, if your students are too, um, have too low of regulation, you can place them near the window or the door where there's more light and more noise. Um, if they're already too high, we can place them in darker areas of the classroom away from stimulation. We can also cover some of our lights. Um, we can cover some of our shelves to hide some of the visual clutter. And then we can incorporate movement into the lessons. So like in social studies, we could use skits to act out those historical events. Um, in math, we could practice skip counting um, with using our students as manipulatives. We can teach grouping and multiplication using the kids um, as the manipulatives. 
We can, in science, we can create the solar system using students and have them orbit around the moon within the classroom. And here's some examples um, for some whole class alerting activities. When they're seated, they could do leg raises, knee lifts, arm circles, waist twists. Um, they could use fidgets or flexible seating. You could also have kids use active student responding strategies like stand up if the answer is yes, sit down if it's no. Um, when they're standing, they could do squats, um, half jacks, marching, windmills, wall push-ups, lunges. Um, you could use websites like Go Noodle, Move to Learn, or Jack Hartman um, to help you find some video ideas. And then while seated, they could lift the book overhead. Um, they could do chair push-ups or pull-downs. They could um, squeeze their shoulders, arms, hands, hug themselves, um, lean on the desk to do push-ups, stretches, fidgets, um, flexible seating. And they could do stretches, yoga poses. Um, we could also have sensory bins that they could use um, for a sensory break different types of breathing exercises, muscle relaxation, um, mindfulness exercises, and uh, um, the, a website example would be Cosmic Kids Yoga. So flexible seating options are a really great option for helping um, regulate that sensory input. So a uh, Zenergy ball chair is a, um, that um, rounded red top um, with the legs. Um, and a surf portable lap desk, which is the um, black Z-shaped desk, um, scoop seats, accordion stools, having lots of different options, flexible seating options um, that kids can choose from and use um, to help regulate themselves is a great option for your for classroom and for home. Another option for sensory regulation are sensory corridors, and you can have these to transition from one activity um, to another or from one classroom to another. Um, the key is uh, regulating so that the student's ready when they get to the class. And they can, see sensory corridors provide movement. You can add in deep pressure, um, and they can be utilized by the whole class, or one student could just use it to run an errand. So other options for sensory regulation um, uh, could be having um, outdoor sensory areas or zones. Um, you could have quiet areas for bubbles, chalks, and board game. You can and then have also have active areas where you could have structured activities. Um, and instead of doing things like tag or chase, um, which could be uh, um, overwhelming, you could have an obstacle course. You could have um, a nature walk or I spy. You could have deep pressure areas like hopscotch or where you use sidewalk chalk or climbing on the playground equipment. Um, but think about how, because sensory is very important and it's very important um, to get our kids uh, regulated so that they can participate and learn. So think about how you can use all of these different strategies in your environment um, to be able to help help your kiddos to um, be able to participate and go to their fullest potential. Great, thanks, Krista. All right, we are going to jump into executive functioning skills. Um, executive functioning skills enable us to plan, focus our attention, remember instructions, and juggle multiple tasks successfully. Our students and learners that have FASD do struggle with executive functioning skills. These functions are highly interrelated and the successful application of executive functioning skills requires them to operate in coordination with each other. Executive functioning is independent of how much we know, but rather involves the ability to express or translate what we know into actions. Executive functioning is primarily located in the prefrontal cortex area of the brain this area of the brain is more sensitive to stress than any other areas of the brain. Even mild stress can cause chemical changes, um, which in turn cause the executive function to shut down. So think about the little things that might stress you out and the domino effect that occurs. Um, everything that follows just does not work out how you wanted it to work out. 
This could be as small as you forgetting to set up your coffee pot in, in the night before, thus messing up your normal morning routine to walking into work with an unexpected conference or not having the materials ready that you thought you were going to have. Stressors affect us all and thus affect our executive functioning. Krista mentioned earlier how FASD can affect the brain and this can impact the executive functioning skills of individuals with FASD. We're going to look at some of the supports that we can use to help our students. So executive functioning is an umbrella term for many cognitive processes that we do daily. Some areas of executive functioning include working memory or being able to keep information in mind and put it to use later, flexible thinking or adapting to changing conditions and being able to revise your plans and strategies, organization, which is the development and using of systems to keep track of your materials and other important information, Self-monitoring, um, which is the viewing or monitoring of oneself. It's also known as metacognition. Task initiation and, complete, and completion, so starting and finishing tasks without procrastination. Emotional regulation uh, or managing your feelings to be able to achieve your goals and complete tasks. Inhibitory or self-control, being able to control your emotions and behavior before you act on impulse and time management and planning, developing steps in order to achieve a goal in a timely manner. So what do executive functioning struggles look like? They can manifest in a lot of different ways. You probably won't see one individual with all of these indicators, nor is it a comprehensive list of indicators, but you will look at these characteristics and think of specific individuals that you may have taught or that you may know, and they will probably stand out in your mind. So these things are things like having trouble initiating and completing tasks, difficulty prioritizing tasks, struggling with time management. They have trouble doing multi-step directions or sequence of steps. So if you say, um, I need you to take the trash out and then come inside and put a new bag in and then let the dog outside, one of those things might happen. And then they struggle to remember the rest of it. Um, have difficulty following rules or they might panic when rules change. They have difficulty switching between tasks and difficulty with transitions. Keep in mind that these are general indicators for overall executive functioning struggles. Um, some other things, students may forget what they just heard or read. They may get overly emotional. They have struggle, struggle with organization of their thoughts. They have trouble keeping track of their belongings. They forget to turn in assignments and they get easily frustrated. So there are some things that we can do to help support these. If someone is struggling with working memory, you may see things like difficulty following multi-step directions, needing to reread text to understand, needing to write things down so they don't forget, or they have trouble with mental math or with multitasking. So some strategies that you can utilize to support students with working memory difficulties include checklists and lists, that help the student write down valuable information so that they no longer have to keep it in mind. These can range from a daily schedule to steps in an activity or to-do list to a sticky note made on the fly to help an individual in the moment like the one that's up in the top corner here. It's really never too early to introduce checklists and lists. Anchor charts allow you to chunk important information in a visual format. Students can reference these as often as needed to complete assignments. Graphic organizers are another way to depict information visually. They are visual thinking tools that use pictures to help organize your thoughts. They demonstrate the relationship between facts, ideas, or concepts, and guide your thinking as you complete the diagram or map. This ties to working memory because by writing information down, it frees space in the brain to do other things. And mnemonics, such as this one here for coordinating conjunction, fanboys, are another great strategy to help students remember the steps or rules while engaging in an activity. If an individual has difficulty in flexibility, they may get stuck in one way of solving a problem or insist on one way of doing things. These individuals may be black and white thinkers. They may have trouble with adapting to new social situations and understanding unwritten social rules. And these students may seem bossy and controlling when interacting with their peers. An individual with weak self-monitoring skills 
um, may have trouble setting goals for themselves or difficulty knowing when they don't understand a task. They may not know their own strengths and weaknesses, and they rarely make a plan for studying for tests or completing projects. Um, they typically don't notice mistakes in their work and they fail to ask for help when it's needed. Visual supports can really help a learner with their flexible thinking and self-monitoring. You can teach learners how to ask for help. This visual gives the learners an idea of what they can do in case they are stuck. The individual schedule clearly shows that there will be a change here with the red X that's going to be occurring at the end of their day. And we can help learners reflect on their behavior and their over or under reaction to certain events by using the how big is my problem scale. And finally, adults can use think alouds while doing their tasks. This allows learners to eavesdrop on the thoughts, on their thoughts while the adults are describing what they're doing and why they're doing it. For learners who struggle with organization, these are your kiddos that seem to create a mess wherever they go. They lose their belongings. Um, they don't know where items go even after being shown. They have messy, disorganized work and fail to bring needed items from home to school and school to home. Time management, planning struggles may seem uh, to have students who lose track of time or they're chronic chronically late. They might underestimate how long a task will actually take them. They may set unrealistic goals. Um, these might be your kiddos who forget appointments or after school activities, and they may complain about feeling rushed and seem unaware of passing time. Using visual timers can help individuals start and stay on task for a specific amount of time. We can teach students to plan backwards, like with using the long-term project planner. They have set short-term deadlines for themselves in order to make it through the project. Using digital tools is also extremely helpful. Um, something like the Reminder app can create notifications reminding them of their required tasks. Color coding systems may be very helpful for some individuals to learn organizational skills. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. We can provide a picture model of what their space looks like when it's tidy and organized, and they can refer to that picture to make sure that they are keeping that space tidy and organized. Whether it, this is the classroom or a study space at home, we should make sure that there's a designated space that learners associate with being focused and productive. A designated workspace um, should be flexible and functional, should use a timer for work time and break time, should have all the needed materials readily accessible so they don't get up and start looking for things and get distracted, and it should be as distraction-free as possible. We can also help our students with task initiation and completion by using something like a task analysis that can help individuals with self-monitoring as they're making sure that they complete all of the steps of the required task. They can check these off as they move through the task, which also supports working memory, or they could review what they did and when they think they're done to see if, if they actually did all of the steps. Um, we can also use chunking, which breaks the assignment or task into manageable chunks. Chunking allows the student to better process the information and requirements. It may help the learner feel less overwhelmed or less frustrated. In the example on the screen, it's a manila folder cut into thirds. There are 18 algebra, algebra problems on here, but the student only sees six at a time. When they're done with these six, they close the flap, they open the middle, and they only see the next six. So it cuts down on that anxiety of having so much to do. And for those that struggle with emotional regulation and self-control, um, they might be seen as highly emotional or having big feelings. Their moods can change quickly and they may be difficult to soothe when they are upset. Um, they might be quick to disagree or argue with others. They may also have difficulty recognizing and identifying their emotions. Um, they may not have filters and they may blurt out whatever comes to mind first. Turn taking can be difficult for individuals who struggle with self-control, and they may also have difficulty anticipating their consequences of their behavior. Um, here are some examples that can be used at school or at home to help with learning self-regulation skills. 
we have the five point scale here, which describes how a child is when they are calm, all the way up to escalated, and what they can do to help them start to regulate. We can teach them to ask for breaks. And when they ask for a break, what do they do? They go to the little break area and they have self-regulation activities, such as this breathing rainbow here. Um, and we can also use visual cues to help the st student who is blurting out in class to remember they need to raise their hand or to listen. And we're gonna talk about a few behavior supports that you can implement at home or at school. Um, behavior cues um, remind individuals of the rules or expectations that we want them to follow. Individuals will be successful when parents and teachers provide those clear expectations and that they're visual, taught, and referenced throughout the day, like Krista mentioned earlier when she was giving an overview of visual supports. Here are some examples of behavior cues that we can use. One is a visual support on how to walk in line, what we need to do to get ready for class, or what to do when we want to answer a question. And you'll notice they just put out the expectations um, for the students. Here are more behavior cues. The one on the left is an example of a visual that helps the student oper operate, um, learn the classroom rules. And the one on the right is an example of how to use a Chromebook in class. And finally, here's an example of a visual behavior cue for helping a student remember how to breathe and how to relax. So today we learned about the brain differences with FASD and the impacts to learning. We discussed strategies that could be implemented to set up successful family school partnerships. And we talked about the best practices and supports to add to the home and or school environment. If you have questions, our contact information will be on the last slide. We'll leave that up for a moment. If you could pause the video and scan this QR code with your phone and take the survey for Chris and I, give us any feedback you have about our presentation, that would be great. Finally, again, access to our handouts and resources from the beginning of the presentation, but you can take a moment here to scan again. And finally, contact information for Krista or I if you have any questions. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. And we hope you found this session informational.